All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to open our Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to continue talking about, we started talking about last week, and we're going to go ahead and finish this week. We started talking about the sufferings of Paul, and, um, and I wanted to get into a little bit this week of talking about the sufferings that we are going to go through as believers, and we didn't have time last time to really get into that and start to look at that. Um, but in Colossians chapter 1, if you guys go with me to verse, let's start in verse 21 and just read through here. He says, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, what? The hope of glory. And, and so Paul, he's been talking about who we were and now who we've been made in Christ and how the goal of, of Christ reconciling and bringing back everything to himself is to present us to the Father in verse 22 as holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. How's he going to do that? He's going to do that as all of us as members of the body of Christ, and he's going to present us to the Father as that. And so, so as we look at that of who we are in Christ, we should be focusing on that. And then he talked about in verse 23 of how we have a hope that's laid up for us in heaven, the hope of the gospel, the hope which is Jesus Christ, the hope of all of, of our glorification, and, and to keep our focus on that and not be, who we are in Christ can't be changed. We do have a hope which is in heaven, but how we think in our thinking process while we're still here can change. And so he's, he's instructing the church at Colossae here to focus on the hope that we have. And remember, we can't be moved away from that hope. Now, positionally, while we're here living in this present evil world, that hope can be taken. We looked in 1 Corinthians 15 of how the church there was talking, and, and he's talking to the church at Corinth, and, and they were starting to say that the resurrection didn't take place. The resurrection of Christ didn't take place. And Paul went through the whole account and he basically, the conclusion is, if Christ hasn't risen from the dead, we have no hope. And so we need to keep our focus on the hope that we have. And so we started looking at the sufferings of what Paul went through. And in, in verse 24, he says, who now rejoice in my sufferings for who? Who's he suffering for? He's suffering for the church there. And, and he's reminding him of that. And he says, And fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is what? The church. And, and so we need to go back and look. I don't think we looked at it last time. In Acts chapter 9, Paul's commission here, you know, and I don't think I stressed it enough, and I wanted to stress this point a little bit more. The sufferings that Paul went through are not going to be the same sufferings that we go through. And the reason why is the Apostle Paul was called for a specific purpose, right? We're not going to be able to go through the same things that he went through. Now, some of the things, maybe we do go through some things. Maybe we go through people forsaking us. Maybe we go through people ignoring us. Maybe we have people physically harm certain people because they're upset. But the sufferings of Paul was something that was given to him by Christ. Go with me to Acts chapter 9 and verse 15. Acts chapter 9 Verse 15, this is after Jesus had came. And so, and then he says, but the Lord said unto him, Acts chapter nine, verse 15, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Verse 16, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for whose sake? For my name's sake. Part of Paul's calling was what? that he was going to suffer for his sake. And did Paul suffer for his sake? Oh boy, did he did. We went last time and looked at the listing of all the things that Paul went through and all the things that he saw, all the perils, all the, all the terrible, terrible things that he went through. Why did he go through it? For the, for the cause of Christ. 
Why? Because he was commissioned by God with the special message that God and his foreknowledge knew that at a specific time, he was going to say, now is the time to reveal the mystery which I had hid in myself, and now it's time for everyone to know. Why? Because Israel had forsaken their king, and God had hidden himself at the perfect time, the perfect time to reveal his grace, his message and dispensation of grace. And he revealed that through Paul, and Paul suffered greatly for going and preaching this. And, and we looked at, in 2 Corinthians, just go, let's just look at that real quick. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Second Corinthians chapter 11 and starting in verse 23, he says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more, and labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, what? the care of all the churches. That was part of his commission was to have, to give that care to all the churches. Now you look at us today, and, and for example, I'm married to my wife, Brianna. I can't go out and start sharing the gospel of the grace of God and just say, oh, by the way, babe, I'm going over here to China and I'll be over there for three months preaching at the churches there. Can I do that? No, because God said, first and foremost in my life is to take care of my wife. Does that make sense? And then if you have children, which I don't have any, but if I did have children, next would be my wife, and then I need to take care of my family. Now, if I leave my family and my wife and go and do that, I'm biblically in the wrong because God tells me I need to take care of my family first. And so the focus needs to be on not that we're going to suffer like you see all the things Paul went through. We're not going to suffer like that. I don't think anybody ever is going to go through what the Apostle Paul went through. But then the focus needs to be is, okay, Paul went through all this. How did Paul get through all this? What was his focus on? And you go to chapter 12, and you see what Christ said to him. In chapter 12, in verse 7, 2 Corinthians 12, in verse 7, he says, "...unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And what did Paul do? He says in verse 8, for this thing I besought the Lord, what? He went and asked the Lord thrice to do what? That it might depart from me. He went and said, Lord, please, please. He said, take this from me. May it go away from me. And then what was the response in verse 9? And he said unto me, my grace is what? So when we're going through struggles in this life, what do we need to remind ourselves of? His grace is sufficient. His grace is enough. And what, what, what does Paul then say? He says, he, it continues on. He says, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I what? What an awesome testimony to be able to see. Paul gets the answer. Christ comes to him and says, my grace is sufficient for thee. Paul doesn't go out and say, well, I, I don't think that's enough for me. That's not good enough for me. But no, what does he say? He says, most gladly, therefore, he says, I am now going to go and take pleasure in my infirmities that I have. May we be able to say the same thing when we're going through things, when we're struggling. Realize that God's grace is sufficient. God's grace has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. God's grace has made us accepted in the beloved. God's grace has made us complete in Christ. So when we're going through struggles and problems in this life, which by the way, we will, we need to focus on 
who we are in Christ. Who, focus on, if Paul can go through all these sufferings, guess what? For him to be able to say, okay, your grace is sufficient. It is enough. That's because the word of God was effectually working in him. And that same word of God that was working in Paul, the same spirit of God that dwelled in Paul, guess where it dwells? In us. Does that make sense? So this morning, I want to focus on a little bit of the reality of problems. Problems is not something that's new in the Bible. I don't think I talked really that, that much about this last time. Problems is not something that is new in the Bible, and problems is something that a believer should expect. A lot of times in Christianity, people will tell you, oh man, once I was saved, all my problems forever went away. Well, my sin problem went away. My old man went away. I'm now made new in Christ. That's all correct. But am I still going to face problems in this life? Oh, absolutely we are. And, and so... I think we actually looked at some of these verses last time. But go with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Yeah, we looked at some of these verses, but we got some more verses coming up. Philippians chapter 1. And we looked at how problems was in the Old Testament, problems was in the time of Paul, and problems also for the little flock of the nation of Israel. And I don't think we need to talk about the problems and the sufferings they're going to go through in tribulation. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But in Philippians chapter 1, and verse 27, he says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. What, what, we stop and say, well, what does that mean? What does it mean that my conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ? It means that how I live my life should display the life of Christ living through me. So sometimes we have to stop and think about, is my life displaying that? Is it displaying the gospel of Christ? And then Paul says that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that they stand fast, how? In one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. What should we be doing as believers? We should be standing fast together in one spirit. And what? Striving together for the faith of the gospel. Then he says in verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Verse 29, he says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also what? Is the believer going to suffer? Yes. But how we go through those sufferings is a whole different. Are we going to go through those sufferings knowing that God's grace is sufficient? Or am I going to go through those sufferings and focus on, man, all these things, all these problems, and now I'm just allowing myself to go into all this negative and wrong thinking? Or am I going to allow myself to focus on what the Word of God says and focus on my hope which is laid up in heaven? And that's where the battle of the mind takes place. Biblical characters all throughout the Bible knew of problems. Moses, go and read, we're not going to read through it today, but go and read Numbers chapter 16. Moses experienced problems with the people he was leading. Moses goes up into the mountain to speak with God, right? First of all, God brings his people out by a mighty hand, crosses the Red Sea on dry ground. Now Moses is going to go up and communicate with God and come down with the laws of God and the covenant. And so when he comes down, what are the people doing? Worshiping false gods. They're worshiping idols, right? So go and read through the account there in Numbers. Job experienced problems with Satan. Go with me to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Doesn't that just make your skin kind of boil when you read that? Verse 8, And it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth, in the earth, a perfect and upright man, 
One that feareth God and escheweth evil. What a great test. Imagine God saying that about you. That's what he had to say about Job. He says, have you considered my servant Job? That means he hadn't. God knows Satan hasn't. And so he brings it up to him. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, the Job fear God for naught. Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And you go in through and read the account of Job. Job lost his family. He lost his land. He lost all that he had. But you know one thing he didn't do? He did not curse God. And he knew he had a redeemer. Isn't that amazing? Everything that he had was gone. But he still would not curse God. Think about that. He lost everything. But would not curse God. David experienced problems with sin. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Second Samuel chapter 11. Let's start in verse 1 here. It says, And it came to pass, Second Samuel 11 verse 1, and it says, And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried still where? What was David's first mistake? He wasn't with his troops on the battlefield. He stayed home. Then verse 2, And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So David ran back into the house and said, Okay, I don't know why she's doing that. Is that what he does? No. No. It says, And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba the son, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her. So David commits the act of adultery. Instead of going back in, first of all, instead of being with his troops like he's supposed to be, then he's out watching this woman, which, by the way, why is this woman outside washing herself on top of a roof? Okay, so there's a problem on both ends here. And so anyways, David goes in and sleeps with her and does all these things, right? And so what does David do? You can go back and read the rest of the account yourself. David takes Uriah, comes back from winning the battles. Uriah comes and David says, because he knows that Bathsheba is going to have a child and it's his child, he tells Uriah, go home and be with your wife. You know what Uriah does? Uriah stay, says, my troops have not all been fed. My troops are not all ready to go home. I'm going to stay with my troops until they're ready. Does the honorable thing. And David insists that he goes home, go home, go home. He doesn't. So then you know what David does? David puts Uriah on the front lines and has Uriah killed. And even his own guard, David's own guards told him, if you put Uriah on the front, he's going to be killed. And David still had him put on the front lines. So adultery eventually led to him murdering Uriah. So David had a problem with sin. Do you think we'll have a problem with sin? A man that God says that he is a man after my own heart had a problem with sin. I think we're going to have a problem with sin, right? Did David love God, though? Yes. Did David have a great faith for God? Yes. Because Nathan the prophet comes to him, and he doesn't argue and say, well, you know, you're right. He instantly falls down and he knows what he did. And he had a great faith. Go and read that account. Paul experienced problems also with other believers as well. Go to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. And there's a few other verses up there. I encourage you guys to write them down and go look at them. 
Acts chapter 15. In verse 36, Acts chapter 15 and verse 36. It says, in some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Verse 37, and Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark, but Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them with uh, Pamphylia, I guess I'll go with that. And went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So there was a dissension. There was a problem between Paul and Barnabas. You learn a little bit more about that, by the way, in the book of Galatians of what was going on there between Paul and Barnabas. So you can look at that. But you see these issues. And it's different types of problems and different types of issues. But we see that there's always problems throughout the whole Bible. And if we are encountering problems in our lives, it does not mean that we are lacking faith. So many people, you'll hear so many people say, well, you're just having these problems because your faith just isn't strong enough. You're in the hospital because your faith just isn't strong enough. You're struggling in life because your faith just isn't strong enough. No, we might have problems. We're going to go through why believers have problems. And maybe it's because we're not being in the word of God, but it's not because we're lacking faith, because we understand that Christ's faith is perfect. Problems are simply a reality of life for us as believers. And problems are something that every believer must face and will face. But we will never eliminate every problem out of our life. Paul says that if we were to leave sin, we'd have to leave the world itself. So, does that make sense? So where does the source of problems come from? The source of problems. Why do believers go through problems? Where do they come from? And uh, there's several reasons. I'm going to only cover four, but there could be more. I'm not going to say there's more. But number one is that some problems come through satanic assault. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter two. And what's going on here is, is Paul's talking about the man in First Corinthians, actually. The man in, in First Corinthians, he had committed adultery with his stepmom. And Paul writes to the church and says, Hey, what are you guys doing? I'm hearing about this. I don't even hear about this among the Gentiles, and you guys are just allowing it openly in the church. What is going on? You need to go and talk to this man. If he doesn't have a godly sorrow, you need to take him and put him out of the church. This cannot be going on. And so the church of Corinth does that. Now it's at the point the man has godly sorrow, and now they're like, oh, no, 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 you can't come back. So Paul's writing to them and saying, you need to forgive him as a brother now and bring him back in. And so why do we do that? In verse... Um, Let's start in verse uh, 8, chapter 2 and verse 8. He says, Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your what? Your love towards him. You need to let him know. Then verse 9, For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. He says, I'm going to forgive. Why? Because Christ has forgiven me. Why? Verse 11, lest Satan should get a what? What is one way that Satan can get an advantage of us? Unforgiveness. Not confirming our love. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his what? Devices. Unforgiveness is one of those. Because it can cause divisions. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 11. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. He says, Put on the whole armor of God, that he may be able to stand against what? The wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that he may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done what? All to stand. And so we see and we understand that the things that we're going to fight against, sometimes, guess what? We're not going to see it. It's a spiritual warfare. But, but, we need to, as believers, not fall into the mentality that all of our problems comes because Satan's causing these problems in my life. I hear that quite frequently. And a lot of times the problems are not coming from this. A lot of times people like to blame all their problems on, oh, well, this is Satan coming under, I'm under satanic assault, I'm under satanic attack because I know the dispensation of the grace of God and I preach it, so I'm under attack. Satan didn't even under, know who Job was, by the way. God told him, consider my servant Job. He didn't even know who Job was. And look at the man Job was, a man that can have everything taken away from him and not curse God. He didn't even know that guy. But we need to make sure that, you know, and sometimes our problems will come from that. But many times... Satan will use problems that are already in our lives and simply try to exploit them. Another problem, another where problems come from is some problems come through violating the principles we've been taught from God's word. What does that mean? Bad choices. How many of us have made a bad choice in our lives? All of us have made a bad choice in our lives, right? Maybe some of you, only half of you raised your hand, so maybe I need to talk to you guys. All right. We've all done bad choice. We've all made silly mistakes, stupid mistakes. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. And verse 4. And he says, But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own what? Verse 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also what? For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap what? Corruption. But he that sowed to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. He's saying, keep that focus on the things above. Because guess what? One day we are going to reap. What are we going to reap? Being glorified with Christ. The blessings we have in Christ. Being given rewards from Christ. What a wonderful thing to think about. But if we're going to sow to the flesh, guess what's going to happen? You go to Romans chapter 6. We use the verse all the time when we share the gospel with people. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. What is the context, though, of Romans chapter 6? Who am I in Christ? I'm now dead to sin. I'm made alive to God. So if I'm going to continue living in sin, the wages of sin, the payment for that is what? Death. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Focusing on who I am in Christ will give me life. We've looked at where does our life come from? Christ who is our life. But if I'm walking and living in sin, what does it say? I'm going to reap according to that. So if I go out and I do something, say, for example, to Drew, all right, and I go and do something really, really mean to him, really terrible, right? I go and I steal his car, okay? He'd be pretty upset, right? Yeah. I go and steal his car. Am I going to suffer consequences from that? Number one, we're probably not going to be friends, right? No, he might, so he might forgive me, okay? But number two, I'm going to go to jail. Now, is that coming through satanic assault? No, that's because I'm an idiot and I go and I take his car, right? So sometimes the things that we do, I go out and I'm constantly going and telling little white lies to everybody. Oh man, I can't believe that, you know, Cheryl, 
right? And then and someone else goes tell someone else, and now it gets back to Cheryl. Is she going to be upset? Yeah. Now am I going to reap that? <laughs> oh, yes. Because it's going to get back to Brianna, and then I'm in trouble. <laughs> All right, so a lot of times it comes from bad choices in our lives. And we must take the blame and responsibility for our own actions. So many people, you look in society today, no one wants to take responsibility when they mess up. We need to take responsibility when we mess up. Sometimes problem comes in our lives because also those around us make bad choices concerning the word of God. Does that make sense? We might be following the word of God and trying to follow, but then the people we surround ourselves with are not. And you know what happens? If I, I'm following, say where I'm following the word of God, and then I surround myself with some other people, and they're not following the word of God, what's eventually going to happen to me? I'm going to start violating those principles, making mistakes, and then I'm going to become just like them. That's why when we are living the life of Christ, sharing the life of Christ, when someone doesn't want to receive that, that's where that comes, that point of separation. Sometimes that's hard because that might be someone that's really close to us. But it's a choice we have to make. Sometimes problems come simply because we live in a fallen creation. You know? And that's where most of the problems in our life are going to come from. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Knowing we live in a fallen creation, we need to make good choices on who we're around. Romans chapter 8 and verse 22. He says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves, what? Also. Which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Why? He says, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our what? Focusing on those things which are above. Focusing on, are we going to be redeemed one day? Yes. Are we going to be glorified fully in Christ one day? Yes. But while we're here, is there times that we groan? Is there times that there's travail? Yes. Why? Because it's a fallen creation. You go and read, let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. I started late, so I'm going to go a few minutes over, guys. Sorry, Alyssa. <laughs> Genesis chapter 6. We won't go too far over. Genesis chapter 6. And, um, you know, the Bible didn't make it too far, did it? Genesis chapter 6, and God's already having to wipe out the whole earth. Didn't make it very far. And why? Because they violated God's principles, and they were just involved in wickedness, involved in sin. And so God had to, at this point, he gives judgments. Today, you know what God does? He gives grace. He gives mercy. He gives peace. That's why it's so important we get on with the work here now. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. And it says, he says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, how? Continually. What a terrible state of mankind. Go to uh, verse 12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was what? What did God say in Genesis chapter 1 when he beheld the earth? He said it was good. He actually said, and it was very good. And now we come to Genesis chapter 6, and what does he say? It's corrupt. And, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. What a terrible state. We, see, we look at the state today of mankind. What is mankind doing? As in the times of Noah, you see the same thing going on. And now you see it, and Des has been talking about, now you see it taking place in the church. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Being lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Do you think these guys were like that? Noah was building this ark. 
and telling them that there was a flood coming, you know what they did? They mocked, made fun of him. He was a preacher of righteousness and they didn't want to listen. They didn't care. But you know what God did? God had a plan in himself to reconcile all things to himself, to bring us back to him. Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, what did we not have before the blood of his cross? Peace. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things where. What is the goal? To bring all things back to himself. To present us to the Father as holy, unreprovable, unblameable. But while we're here, we're going to face problems. But we need to bring our focus back to what did Christ do for me? He gave his life for me. He loved me. He gives me his grace. He brought me back to himself. His grace is sufficient. His grace is enough. But the reality is, is that as long as we live in a sin-cursed earth, there's going to be problems. There's going to be pain. There's going to be sufferings. But we need to focus on who we are in Christ. Romans 8, verse 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed where? In us. Us, the body of Christ. It's not worthy. When we focus on these problems we have, what does Paul say? It's, you can't even put it on a scale. You can't even compare it of the glory that's going to be revealed in us. So when we're dealing with sufferings in this life, that's what we need to focus on, the glory that's going to be revealed in us, the things we have in Christ. When Paul was cast into prison and was beaten down and locked into the innermost part of the prison with Silas, he wasn't in there just crying and saying, oh, my life is so terrible. He was in there singing praises to God. Why? Well, not because he's like, oh, man, these marks and these lash marks on my back feel so great. No, because he focused on who he was in Christ. The inheritance he had in Christ. And by the way, we always focus on Paul. But Silas was beaten down and thrown in there too. You know what he was doing? Singing praises along with him. Another thing that happens in our lives is that sometimes problems come because of persecution due to living a godly life. Now, a lot of times, that's not the case. But sometimes that is the case. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I think we can all kind of relate to that. A lot of times when we have a problem, if we look back at the situation of the problem we've been dealing with, we can look at it and say, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that. But sometimes it's like, man, this guy just despises me and hates me and all I've ever done has been kind to him and and shared the word of God. Well, that's because we're, you're living godly. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's start in verse 10. He says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, what? Suffer persecution. You know what I love about that ver those verses there? In verse 10, Paul says, Thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life. What was his testimony? It reflected the doctrine. Our testimony, who we are, should reflect what? Doctrine. It should reflect having long-suffering, displaying charity, displaying patience. And sometimes, guess what? There's going to be persecutions and afflictions. Paul was ready to suffer more. We see that in Colossians chapter 1. 
He wanted to fully accomplish his suffering for Christ and rejoice in it. Go with me. We're in 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We see at the end of what Paul says here. He says in verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure what? Who's going to suffer afflictions? Well, he's writing to Timothy. He says, endure them. Who else will suffer? We will. He says, but watch on all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. That means he has participated. It doesn't mean Paul's saying, man, look at what I did. I did such a good job here. No, he's saying he participated in the good fight. He wasn't waved off. I have finished my course. He finished his section of what he needed to do. It's like a relay. You're going. You're running this leg of the race. And Paul's now ready to be offered and he's getting ready to depart. What does he do? He says, Timothy, it's your turn to carry on the doctrine and preach the word. I have what? Kept the faith. That means he protected it. He laid hold on it. He guarded it. He preached it. He was unashamed of it. And then, what's the result? Verse 8, Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that what? Love is appearing. What does that mean? Focusing on, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. Focusing on things above. Focusing on the hope which is laid up for us in heaven even while we're going through our sufferings and our problems. Go back with me to Colossians chapter 1. Now that was a little bit out of the context of Colossians chapter 1, but I thought it was, in, I thought it was good to talk about the problems we're going to face because the problems Paul's faced, we're not going to face all those problems, all those sufferings. But we are going to face problems as believers, and we need to realize what, and focus on where does my problems come from and we can correct a lot of times those problems simply by allowing God's word to work in us. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, he says, Who now, what? Rejoice in my sufferings. Isn't that a wonderful thing Paul says there? Paul goes through sufferings, and you know what he says? Who now rejoice in my sufferings. For who? For you. And fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. He's going to do it. Why? To get the word of God out. And he's going to tell us what he's sharing now. What was he made a minister for? To share the dispensation of the grace of God. To share the mystery which was hid from other ages. To share the mystery that Christ now is going to indwell us as Gentiles. That was the mystery. So I encourage you guys now to go and read the rest of Colossians chapter 1. And next time we talk in the book of Colossians, we're going to start looking at of the dispensation of God, what it means that he came to fulfill the word of God. You know, that's an interesting term that he uses there. But to think about the sufferings Paul went through to get this message out. And then also to focus on the problems that we're going to face as well and how we can get through that because God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is enough. I am complete in Christ. We are complete in Christ. We are accepted. We are perfect. We're unblameable, unreprovable, holy in his sight. Now we need to get out there and live like that. That's what Paul's telling them to do here. Amen? Let's give thanks. Father, thank you for us being able to come here and look at the sufferings of Paul and what great things he suffered for your sake. And also, thank you for allowing us to be able to see of how we as believers will go through problems in this life and sufferings in this life. And they might not be the same as Paul, but we will go through them and how they, your grace is sufficient for us as well. Your grace is enough and your love is enough. And your peace is enough. Thank you for giving us your perfect word to be able to see of the things of who we are in Christ and the hope which we have in you. We give thanks always by Christ. Amen.